Amen. So as uh, uh, we have some experience actually falling asleep at wheels, okay? So don't, uh, don't judge. But about 14 years ago, we were driving. We had drove, driven up to Tyler and back from Tyler in one day. And I got from Johnson City, and I was the driver at the time, somewhere between Johnson City and probably, I don't know, maybe Stonewall, I think in that area, you know, that long stretch. And um, I heard Kate scream, Mom! All five of us were in our car, but from the back seat, I had veered over the yellow line. And she was on Thailand time, so she was awake. And I woke up to get it back into the lane without a problem. I don't know if you've ever done that, but after a long drive, you can get that road. What do you call that? Road vision or, I don't know, some kind of vision. Rose, road what? Road hypnosis. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we, yeah, you get that. You get, like, you see the lines, and you see the lines, and you keep going, and it's dark. And it was probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe one in the morning or so, and I'm not good after nine anyways. I don't know what I thought I was doing. So there was one other time. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it fair, so I'm going to tell on Michael this time, you know, because, you know, like, why be married if you can't have a story about him, too? So, We were driving north, probably to Dallas, I guess, and um, we were going to, um, oh, I'm all hooked up? Oh, I don't look cute like that. I'm going to fix that. Um, So I, uh, we were driving, and we were going north, and I kind of cuddled up in my little chair there, and I was so cozy. I felt good. When all of a sudden, I was like, open your eyes. I opened my eyes. And I looked to my handsome husband, who has his eyes closed. (laughs) And so my rest was over. (laughs) It was the middle of the day, though. I don't know what happened, but I remember we were right, like, you know, where that baby head cemetery is. Nobody could forget that name, right? <laughs> like, ugh, what the heck is going on in Texas? So we go past the baby head cemetery, and I'm, like, wide-eyed. All the way, all the way, we're north, wherever we were going, as far as we were going. But, um, you know, sometimes we get into ourselves into situations that can turn out so bad. Have you ever found yourself in those kind of situations that could, could have turned out really negatively. Well, um, so what does it mean to fall asleep at the wheel? Uh, Gosh, when I looked this up, I was like, how irresponsible. (laughs) Okay, so what does it mean to fall asleep at a wheel? It means failing to attend to one's responsibilities or duties, not doing or paying attention to that which is important or for which one is responsible. We're responsible. And so this week, I kind of wanted to tie that in even to our Christian walk, what we're doing with our life, how we're going along. Are we steady and going forward and, you know, really pursuing the things of God, or are we kind of maybe being irresponsible? And actually, uh, not doing or paying attention to that, which is important. And I had to even check my own heart and go, whoa, thank you, God, for a reminder. Thank you for helping me get, you know, because sometimes when we're responsible, uh, we need to pay attention. We need to be mindful. So today I kind of want to really look at Romans today, and I'm going to spend a lot of time in there and use it a lot for my some of the points that I have. Um, but I do want you to go back and read Romans 8 for homework this week. So I like to give you homework because, just because. Why not? It's good for you. It's, you know, I mean, God's word is alive and powerful, and it it, it helps us to grow, and it gets us in that right frame of mind. So I'm actually going to read it out of the message translation for this, for this, um, this portion here. 
And it says in Romans 8, verse 1 and 2, with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that faithful, fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. See, he wasn't asleep. He was wide awake. It was important enough. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. That's why he had to come himself. The law wasn't bad, but it wasn't, it wasn't going to save us from ourselves. The law, it always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Man, that, I just feel like it's, that's just priceless to me how God gave his one and only son. He made a plan. He helped us. So um, my first point here is you have been given a life. You have life. Life in you. There's breath in you. And you will continue to have life until you don't have your spirit within you anymore. And then at that point, so you have your body is your vehicle. So we're going to kind of use that as our illustration today is our body is the vehicle going on this journey. And I'm going to take you on this journey with me. And uh, you have been created and born in the image of God. Almighty God. And as humans, we have a free will. We have a choice. We can choose right or wrong, life or death, heaven or hell. That's powerful choices right there. We can be born again. We can walk in the spirit. We can choose to love God, love our neighbors, serve others. So, I do want to walk in that supernatural love of God. And it's a choice, a choice that we have to make daily, sometimes even hourly. (laughs) You know, like something can happen and and something could want to take you out of that place, out of love, out of walking in the spirit. And so Romans 8, 9 through 14 says, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, if he's in there, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. That's a good reminder. You might want to underline that. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With the spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. So you don't, so don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and go on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. I used to love that. Oh, the places you'll go. You know, everyone would read that to our kiddos. And I mean, you would think about it. I would even think about it um, 
you know, like for myself, oh, the places I'll go, I want to go so many places. And every time I had an opportunity to go somewhere, I did. And I'm so glad, so glad. I got to see a lot of things that I wouldn't have gotten to see if I wasn't, if I didn't say yes. So we want to say yes. So my second point is you're the driver in your life, in this vehicle. You're the driver, you yourself. God has a plan and purpose for your steps. He's put you on a path, and he's ordered your steps, so you are in the driver's seat. How many many of you don't like to drive? Anybody? Oh, a couple. What? One? Oh, one lonely. Two lonely people. Okay. The rest of you are the, you're already used to driving. You you probably fight over the wheel. Who's going to drive first? So we have a rule at our house. Whenever we're going somewhere, San Antonio or Austin, I always drive first because I'm the late, I'm not the late driver. I don't, I'm not good at night. So. Michael takes the second shift. So we kind of have this thing. We just know, well, he, I drive there and he drives home. It's just kind of, and then he can do whatever, you know, he can sleep safely on the right side. And I, so, and I can sleep safely on the right side when it's my turn. So we want to make sure that um, you are the driver of your life. And in this, God has ordained your steps. And in the driver's seat, you got to hold on to that wheel. You got to buckle up. You got to, you got to get, you know, get going. And so I want to encourage you not to squelch within you your ability, your call, your desire, what God has put in there. Maybe, you know, you have dreams that he's put in you. You have a plan. You're gifted and you're talented. And so with that, there comes a responsibility as well. You're responsible to do what he's asked you to do. Well, you go, I don't know what he's asked me to do. Well, We're going to talk about it. We're not going to just leave you hanging. And so what if you think about it, what am I gifted or talented at? And how could I use that for the Lord? Okay, if it's blank, we got issues. So uh, (laughs) you're called to something. You have something. You know it. You know, and maybe it's your being a mom or being a grandmother or maybe it's working at the office or helping at school and teaching kids and those things, those are gifts. Do you know not everybody can deal well with children? You know not everyone can deal well with older people? Do you know not everyone can deal well with cleaning their house? You know, like there's a gift within you. Right? It's not just the, it's not just the big things like you're going to, you know, We deny him when we don't allow the little things, like Michael was saying, being thankful for those little things. I was thinking, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I was wanting to say, bring out, was that we have to be thankful for the little things that we do and able and capable and willing to do. My highest calling was being a mom for a long time. So I tried to do it as well as I could. I believe in that. I believe in the, when you have children and they, you know, now I have grandchildren. I want to do it well unto the Lord for his glory. Not just for, for, so that, you know, my grandkids like me. That's why they say it's nanny's house and not pop's house. They, I said, pop's lives here too. And they said, no, it's nanny's house. I don't know why, but every time. But I did that with my grandmother, too. So, um, But it's part of my calling. So don't negate what is in you. If you can balance your checkbook, you're doing pretty dang good because there's some people that don't know how to do that. Right? Like, say, thank you, God. I can get this thing together. I can make a budget, and I can stick to it. Like, that's a gift. Well, it shouldn't just be a gift. <laughs> it should just be life. But, you know, if you are good at that, and if you're not good at that, ask the Lord to help you, right? We're working these things out. We're working. I mean, we got to, life is, there's a lot of rules. And so we do have to come up higher. Let me tell you this is from Ephesians 3, because this is going to make you so happy. Um, because this, God's word, man, it's just awesome. In verse 16, it says, may he grant you out of the riches of his glory, to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, indwelling your innermost being and personality. 
You know, he can affect your personality. You don't have to be that ugly. You don't have to act naughty. You can be a good kid. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love. See, that's where it goes back to my love walk, my choice. I'm walking in it. Being fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, with all you, God's people, the width and length and height and depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing endless love, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life completely filled and flooded with God himself. Oh, man, that's a great promise. Now, to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we can dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Oh, man, and I think about that. He's able to carry out his purpose to do abundantly more than we dare ask him. You know, I remember, and, and, and I've probably shared this, but not all of you have heard it, is I failed at speech class in college. I literally walked out of the room. I put my book down, and I'm like, I can't do this. I don't know how to get up in front of people. I don't know how to express myself. I don't know how to talk. <laughs> because it's according out to his purpose and his plans and, and his power at work within us for his glory, right? So the things that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ is is to be able for just not us, it's the next generation after us. And so that he might be glorified in all generations. So as you share even your faith at work and you talk to people, as you, you know, you're like, well, I'm not a preacher, but you're a light in a world that's very dark, that needs hope, that needs help. You know, that people, I, I just love it. I love, I love it when compassionate care, I love medical people that, oh, how how awesome is it to be a medical professional and help somebody who's in dire straits in the worst time of their life that somebody can be so kind to you? I just think that is one of the, uh, the most selfless acts. So, um, so, but you know what? They're called and talented and used for those purposes to benefit the good of community, right? And as um, number three, as you choose to submit to God and you follow his voice, learn it, you follow peace, you follow wisdom from this scripture right here. You are cruising right into a beautiful life with him and you are abiding in him. You're growing as you abide in him and you go on this journey with him and you choose to follow him, you're going to pass by some beautiful scenery on the right and on the left. And guess what? You're going to hit a destination on purpose. And so we need to have our GPS tuned in. You know, wherever I put it, it takes me. But if I don't follow the voice of the girl on there, I'm not going to get there. You know, your volume's turned down. You're like, ah, I can't look and drive, and, you know, i got to change lanes. Sometimes we've got to be have the voice loud enough. And that means the radio has to be turned down. That means that you can't be distracted with your book on tape. You can't be talking on the phone and listening to the girl at the same time, right? And it's a, it's a distraction that won't enable you to get where you're going if it's too many distractions. And so we need a focus. Sometimes that focus is we choose and say, God, I need, that means that there's going to be times of quiet, contemplative times in his presence where we just go, what's on 
what should I do? <laughs> and not do all the talking. <laughs> I think sometimes we love our devotion time to be about us talking. And never, not enough like quiet in his presence. Like he is a God who knows us intimately and he does speak. So remember that. And so we do want to cruise right through life with him. We do want to go on that journey with him. We do want to follow him. We do want to, you know, we do want to be hanging on. You know, I, I kind of like it. You know, have you seen the new Ford Bronco? Anybody? Okay. Okay, that is dreamy. That is just a dreamy vehicle. It puts my minivan to shame. So not that I don't like my minivan, but I mean that, that you know, the one with the help the top, not the little one. I mean, talking the big one because it reminds me of the 80s because my first car was a 78 Chevy Blazer. And I would lock those hubs in. And in Phoenix, you can go out in the desert. Like, it's all land that's just free. It's just free land. Here you have, like, posts with purple on them, and you better not go past them. So, but there, there was no purple posts. And you could just drive in the desert, and you would go up. And, and I would try to, I mean, I wanted to flip that thing. That was my goal. <laughs> my goal was to end up. Upside down one day. <laughs> yes, that was me. Ah, thank you, Jesus. I lived for myself and not submitted to God at that point. And when we do that, we can be very, very stupid and cruise the wrong places and not on the journey he has for us. Now, much more refined. <laughs> but I still like the Bronco. So anyways, so, but we, so we need to make sure that we're cruising through this life with him. I mean, not just putting cruise control on and going, but aware, looking, following the signs, listening to him, not just on our own. Ro I'm going to go back to Romans again and... Uh, this resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. <laughs> Should I read it again? This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurous, expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit, and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the, the hard times with him, then we will certainly, we're going to go through the good times with him. And so, he is the one we cry out to, Father. And, you know, we, he, he even tells us, you know, if a father knows how to give good gifts, but, you know, how much more will your heavenly Father give those who ask? Right? So he has some good gifts for us. So my fourth point here is we're on this coast-to-coast -coast ride with him. It's a long-haul ride. Life is a long-haul ride. And what happens eight hours or into a 14-hour drive? You might get a little tired. You may have to pull over. You may have to stop. You may have to get gas a few times, right? And God doesn't want you to fall asleep at that wheel. Remember what that means, failing to attend to one's responsibilities or duties, not doing or paying attention to that which is important or for which one is responsible. So we got to stay awake on this long journey of life that we're riding in, the, riding in this. And so we can't fall asleep. We can't, get, we can't even get discouraged in doing well. We have to keep ourselves continually encouraged. Well, you don't know what I've been through. Yeah, and you don't know what somebody else has been through. We've all been through stuff. There's a lot of stuff in life. This is, life is, I, I wish I could say it was easy. It's not easy in a lot of ways, but God with us. How much more you think about people who don't have Jesus? They don't have God that they could listen to, and, they, you know, they don't even have the voice. They don't even know the Savior. And so there's a world out there that needs us to help them to know, 
to take care of their to, to help take care of them because they're created in God's image and likeness. And so we must stay in faith and hopeful, far from sin, living holy. We do not want to abort God's plan for our life by falling asleep at the wheel. We can't afford that. But what if you have car trouble? <laughs> you ever have trouble talking to God? There's kind of like a car trouble. You ever have a flat tire with the Lord? You know. You ever uh, uh, had a blowout? You know, Michael and I were married. How many days? In Santa Rosa. Anybody been to Santa Rosa, New Mexico? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody goes to Santa Rosa on purpose, okay? It's really a nothing. Um, so we were out of Phoenix. So we were eight hours into our 15.5-hour drive. And we had a Nissan Sentra pulling a trailer. <laughs> I was going to college, okay? Don't judge. So we're eight hours in, and the little Sentra has a little U-Haul trailer behind it, which, you know, in and of itself probably was not a great idea looking back. But it's what we had. It's what we could afford. It's not real smart, but you know, you're, you're optimistic at 21. <laughs> the world is your oyster. You're just going for it. Okay. So we were married about six days. Yeah. yeah. Six days. And we hit Santa Rosa and we passed Santa Rosa. We're on our way to Oklahoma. And um, so we actually lost our transmission outside of Santa Rosa. So um, I made a little sign. And I was standing on the side of the road, help, <laughs> help me. I didn't know what to do. This is, this is before cell phones, of course. So people were, keep going. And then finally somebody came. A trucker. Did we get into his truck? Yeah. Okay. So we got into his truck. I knew we were in something. It was quite, um, after we were there for about an hour on the side of the road. And we proceeded to spend the next week in Santa Rosa. <laughs> because there's no parts for a Nissan Sentra. And then there's no truck to tow. Then there's no tow dolly within a 100-mile radius. So we were waiting in Santa Rosa um, until uh, we could get all of these things lined up and um, tow the car behind a U-Haul that barely had anything in it. So we ended up with a U-Haul after all and a tow dolly. And we were, <laughs> I mean, my husband, my new husband, would not even take a shower in the shower. It was that bad. Like, that's bad if a man will not shower in a shower, <laughs> you know? And so, but we were following God's plan for our life. But there were creatures in your shower. <laughs> but when you're following God's plan for your life, you're seeking the kingdom doesn't mean everything is just going to always work out. doesn't mean that you're going to hit every juncture with just the right, that nothing's going to go wrong. And I think sometimes we try to tell people, like, you come to Jesus and everything's going to be great, which it is. But we sometimes fail to mention you're going to have to be an overcomer. You're going to have to stand firm. You're going to have to hold on to what God has for your life. You're not going to, I mean, it doesn't just happen. You're going to have resistance now because you're a Christian. Yeah. It's not before the devil left you alone, right? You were, that was just fine. You just did your own thing. You know, I was out in the desert. I couldn't even flip my car, right? <laughs> but I come over 
And you know, I mean, just things start, resistance, resistance. Will I give in? Will I quit? Will I have grit? Will I not? Will I be trustworthy? Will I carry the gospel well? Will I, will I give in at the first sign of trouble? But we had to push. And, we, and I, just, I, mean, I had just received answers to my prayers to get married and have a spouse and have a father to my child and to, to, to dedicate my life to God and to serve him with everything I had. And there's resistance. I'm on the way to Bible college. So I couldn't afford to just give up. But really in that equation, I was do- we were probably doing something wrong pulling a trailer with a Sentra. And we wanted good results. You know, sometimes it's our own fault. We want good results. But we're maybe not doing the wisest thing. So it was under warranty. You're right. <laughs> and we got a free transmission out of it. So that, was, that did turn out good. But they, they said, were you doing anything you shouldn't have been doing? Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes we have to, to, to assess the situation, and, but keep going with him, keep riding with him, keep pursuing the dream that God has in our heart. You know, I know people that haven't, haven't been able to get pregnant, and they just kept pursuing and pursuing and pursuing the Lord to help them. And eventually that dream comes to pass. Because God is faithful. Let's look at Romans 8, 26. Now I'm dropping down. Remember, I'm skipping through some of these, this chapter. And you're going to go back and read it. And meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our life of love for God is worked into something good. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He's decided that from the onset to shape the lives of those who love him, along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original intent, shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. Your mama just didn't name you. You're God. He knew you. He knew you in your mother's womb. He predestined you to live in Fredericksburg, Texas. He knew that you would pass through here. He knew that this was going to be a stop on the road. He knew that Michael and I were going to come here and this was going to be a place for us. We didn't choose Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg chose us. You know, that isn't, I I didn't plan this. But you know what? I wouldn't have planned it any different. He plans better than I do. Me, I just thought this was a little tiny town. Did I know that this was like the hill country of Texas, that I would just be so happy to raise my children here, right? I didn't plan that. God did, because he's good and he's gracious and he knows what you need. He knows what your family needs. He knows what, how to be a good God to you all the time in every situation. So my fifth point is this final point. He is the fuel that enables you to get to the destination. If you abide in him and his words abide in you, you, man, you're going to ask what you will and you're going to know what you need to ask. I'm not saying asking for things that you need to, that you want. I'm asking for things to get you through. Like to get you in this life that it's good for you. You know, I, I, I mean, I've, I've had, Things where I've like needed him 
whether it was sorrow or grief or pain or a lack or whatever, you know, you put, you put it in there, hurt, you know, betrayal, put any word you want in there. And you know what? He's helped me overcome that. Sometimes it doesn't happen the first day or the second day or the first month, <laughs> but you've got to give it to him. You know, he didn't have anything to work with if you don't give it to him. Say, God, help me in this situation. I need you. He, you're my fuel. I got to get through this. You know, I, gotta, I can't stop and stay in my bed even though I want to. Throw the covers over my head. Well, I've never really done that, but, you know, it's a good idea for those who can. <laughs> I'm usually up by six, never much after. Once I slept till eight, and then the other day, a few weeks ago, I slept till eight another day. And that was twice in my life, and I'm really happy about that because that's an accomplishment for me. So I can't throw the covers over my head. Sometimes I wish I could. I just don't have it in me. See, my girls as teenagers, they could just stay in that bed all day, like noon. Even as when I was a teenager, I didn't even do that. So I don't know what's wrong with me, but I do know that I like to be up early and I like to go to bed early. So Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we should be having a good life. We should be able to have some pleasure. We should be able to enjoy things. Jesus did not die for us to not be fulfilled in life. And so if there's a missing piece in life, we got to get with him and find out what can I do, Lord? Where do I need healing? Where do I need recovery? Where do I need counseling? Where do I need help? How can I, how can I get to this good pleasure place? Because you promised it. And so when we... Like Lindsay was saying, when we talk, go to that scripture and say, God, I know this is in there, and it's not, I'm not experiencing this for my life, so I'm going to just say, like, right now, that I am going to have a good life. It's your, I mean, you're going to work in me, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And walk away. Walk away with that. Good pleasure. I'm going to have good pleasure. So when somebody says, how are you doing? I'm having good pleasure. How are you? You know, so I'm having good pleasure. You just keep staying, keep doing, and having good pleasure until good pleasure is what you feel. I'm talking about from his word, not just because I'm not just because I want to have good pleasure, because I'm all about me. Remember, we're selfless. But we need to have some good days. Because serving God should be fun. So here we go. So he's your fuel. He's gonna get you definite to your destination. The way the Amplified says is the same one in Philippians 2.13. It says, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work, that is strengthening, energizing, creating in you the longing and ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. There you go. You could just like, Write that on a card and stick it on your mirror in your bathroom because that might be just what you need to get you over to that place where you are fulfilled for his good pleasure. Romans 8.31, we're going back to Romans. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, Embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly or freely do for us? Wow. And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. That is so cool. Yeah. That is just so cool. I love it. Let's see if I... Oh, okay. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, 
not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in the cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Oh, man. My husband was, re- we sometimes we read together, and he was reading to me about a, a, a priest that was um, at uh, Auschwitz, and he was, he never allowed he was, he was a Polish priest. He actually became killed. He harbored Jews. And, and um, he was, was killed um, in place of another person because that person said, you can't kill me. I have children. I have a family. And the priest said, here, take me. But what happened in there is that he never let them get to him. He never let them control him. He kept his freedom in the midst of being imprisoned. Even though he was imprisoned in the natural, his, his body language, his tone, his, his character remained free. Because he's like, I can't allow you to take my freedom. And so no matter what experience we have, so the troubles that I, I'm reading here, hunger, hatred, homelessness, I, you know, I, I haven't quite had all those. So maybe I'm a little wimpier than I think. So it could be a lot worse. And sometimes we just need to give thanks in the present situation we're in, even though it might be, you know, hard. We might be in a really hard situation. And, but remind yourself that God is with me. And the scripture says, they killed us in cold blood because they hated you. We're sitting ducks. They picked us off one by one. And that's the way they were doing in Auschwitz. None of these phase us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing dead. Oh, I didn't read that part. I'm sorry. Dead, angelic, or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. That that is, oh man, so cool. I have just a couple more scriptures here that I want to leave you with. And, um, and this one in James 1, 12, to just kind of back up this. Blessed, happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres when tempted. For when he has passed the test and has been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. In Hebrews four sixteen. Therefore, let us with privilege approach the throne of grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures. Man, I want mercy when I fail. And find his amazing grace to help in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. So let's stay in that place of following him, riding along with him, hearing him, driving with them, not sleeping at the wheel, right? We want to stay wide awake. We want to stay uh, alert. We don't want to be that one uh, slothful person that doesn't follow the rules, right? We want to stay, we want to stay in control. We want to give our lives to him and make sure that we are living um, the way that we should be and that we're living towards the call of God that he has for us. And I don't know what your call is, but I think you do. Each one of you has something. You know, um, my daughter will get married, and um, and uh, everyone always says, oh, what does her fiancé do? And I said, oh, he's a craftsman. He can make anything out of wood. He's just amazing. You know, he can build buildings, or he could. Um, and so, you know, we celebrate the things in people that they are have ability and skill at. 
And so let people know what your skill is so that they can celebrate it with you, that they can look at it and go, whoa, you can do that. And I love that. And I, most of you, I know a lot of your skills. And I know what you're capable of. And I know what you're good at. And so I want to just encourage you in those gifts, in those places that, and maybe where you feel insecurity kind of tries to creep in and, and squelch your gift and tell you you're not good enough, and tell you you're not, you're not whatever. Fill in the blank. I'm telling you, that's not true. That's not the truth. You're going to make it. and You're going to do well. And you're going to stand before your father one day, and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now here into this rest. And we're going to go, it was worth it. It was worth it to serve God. It was worth it to put, you know, everything else in the back burner. Why don't you stand with me? Let's just thank him for every good and perfect gift that has come down from him. Our life, our breath, our health, our, our journey, our intersection here today. We thank you, God, for all of it. You've been more than kind to us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we call upon the Savior, Jesus. And he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, where we've fallen short, we ask you to cleanse us from falling short. Cleanse us from not trusting you. Cleanse us from trying to do it on our own, in our own might, with our own strength. Father, help us where we've been disobedient. May we come back to you with open arms, and you're going to have open arms. If we're a prodigal, you're going to oh, take us right back in. We love you. We admire you, Almighty God, for who you are. We thank you that we were created in your image, created in your likeness. And so if you're here today and you just need to lay it down, <laughs> maybe you haven't felt like the blessing's been upon you or the favor or anything else, well, I'm here to say, well, it is on you. If you're in Christ and you're repentant and you're willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I to do your bidding. Here am I. I don't want to live a low-level living. I, want, I don't want to be asleep at this wheel any longer. It's horrible to not thrive and live from a place of being revived with you. So we lay down the things that have so easily entangled us right here in this place, at this altar. We just lay it down. And we commit to, to take up our cross and follow you in daily life. We want to honor you with our life. I want to honor you with our thoughts and our words and our character and our purity and holiness. We want to honor you, God, until our last breath. Thank you. Today we bless you with the love of Christ and the fellowship of his spirit. May you go forth from this place with hope, energized with faith.
that if you need prayer today, we are here and available to stand with you and to help you just bring it to the Lord. So if you would like prayer, we'll we'll dismiss and allow you to come forward if you'd like or um, greet your friend or family in Christ and have a blessed, blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen. For I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good. And I know you hold my future and my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. For I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good. And I know you hold my future and my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see come to pass in your name in your name Jesus I will trust every word I hear you say I will see it come to pass in your name in your name I am standing on every promise that you make I will see to pass 